Today's talk will be on controlling ants around the home presented by Dr. Siavash Taravati. Siavash is an urban and structural IPM advisor in Los Angeles County and has been with the UCIPM program since 2015. He is a trained entomologist and a licensed applicator with a qualified applicator license and a structural pest control field representative license. He is experienced in taxonomy, ornamental entomology, and structural pest control. Siavash has presented at numerous pest control and entomological science meetings and currently performs research and extension on different structural and urban landscape pests such as drywood termites, cockroaches, ants, and bedbugs. He has published and presented about pesticide regulations and enjoys helping his clientele with such matters, especially for clarifying federal and state laws. Siavash, you may share your slides and begin your presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, can you hear me? Okay, perfect. It's such a pleasure uh, being here. I'm going to start sharing my screen. Okay. Yeah, so uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Siavash. Um, uh, so I'm an IPM advisor here down in Los Angeles County. I cover four counties, but uh, since our, our program is a statewide program, we work together on various stuff. You know, So I work a lot with Carrie and Belinda and uh, Elaine and Andrew on various uh, pest control issues, especially for me, uh, structural pest control. So today I'm going to talk about controlling ants around the home. So I'm going to talk about the diversity of ants and I'm going to provide some tips on how to control ants to hopefully you know, help you guys um, kind of solve your pest problems with ants. So um, ants are very important. Ants are very important pests in many settings, in agricultural settings, in, in urban settings, in, in the landscape, inside homes. And one survey in 1992 showed that ants are one of the most important pests inside and around homes. And we constantly get new information uh, and, and every single survey tells us that ants are one of the main reasons that people call pest control companies or seek pest control help. Ants are uh, social insects. As you can see on right, you're looking at Argentine ants, this picture. Uh, and by social insects, we mean that they have caste, like a queen, a king, or, or several males. And they have workers. And then they sometimes there are soldiers. If they're not soldiers, sometimes there are there are uh, major workers which defend the colony and uh, workers take care of the young. They forage and uh, look for food and uh, you know, let the colony know if there's a major source of food so they can start forming trails and things like that. So what, what is the problem with ants? Why we are concerned about the ants and why we want to control ants? The first thing is the nuisance. You know, people just, just don't like seeing and you know, especially indoors, you know, on their furniture, on, on the countertop uh, of the kitchen. And uh, the other reason is that they go after food. You know, they, they love pantry, uh, pantry spaces. They get into the pantry, you know, to, to get uh, access to honey, sugar, and they love cat food, dog food. And uh, <clears throat> this is the second problem that the third one especially for you guys who are involved in landscaping, you know, gardening, especially if you're a master gardener, is the, the, the fact that they tend and protect sap feeding insects, uh, especially aphids and soft scale insects because they go after the honeydew that these insects produce, right? And um, they not just, uh, they not only uh, use the, the resources, the, the sugar, the honeydew that these insects produce, but in return, they protect these insects against natural enemies, against lady beetles, against parasitoids. So it's a mutualistic kind of relationship. The other problem that, that uh, sometimes ants create is uh, stinging. Some ants 
and sting and and the sting can be very painful and sometimes uh, can be even dangerous so i'm going to talk about the red important fire ant that we have in southern california in central uh, california and in some places these ants are creating a lot of problems in california we have more than 281 species but only a handful of these are really pests are considered pests or are uh, problematic, okay? There are many ways that we can group ants or kind of uh, artificially classify them. And it's by their shape, morphology or color, and sometimes by their size or size variation, sometimes by diet, sometimes by uh, their nesting site and uh, things like that. So I'm gonna go over all these uh, in, in the next few slides. So one of the major ways that we group ants is by uh, uh, the, the shape of their waist. Sometimes they have one node, as you can see here. Uh, if you look here, you know, there's only one node. But if you look down here, uh, there are two nodes, one, and this is the second one, right? So this is a major way to, an important way to classify ants. Unfortunately, you can't see them in the field. It's really hard to see these nodes in the field, uh, except for larger ants. Um, but you know, if you find a dead ant and you really want to know, it's a very good way of you know, putting them in groups. Uh, the other way that we can uh, identify ants is by their size, general size. So some ants are much larger and some ants are medium size and some of them are pretty small. So for example, if you see harvester ants, they are pretty large, one of the largest ants that we find in California. And uh, on left, you can see a fire ant. And as, as you can see, it's not as big. Of course, they have size variation. So they have small workers and lar larger workers, but they're always smaller than uh, harvester ants. So that's another way. And we have some tiny ants like dark rover ant, pharaoh ant, beef ant. So if you see something really small, you know, I'm talking about you know one millimeter or, or less, it's not a harvester ant. I mean, because harvester ants are always much larger. Um, I talked about size variation, and by that uh, I mean uh, what you can see here on left and right. On left you're looking at Argentine ants inside a home. And as you can see, most of these ants uh, have a similar size. Like this guy here, uh, if you compare it to this one or this or that, all of them are about the same size. But if you look at the right picture, it shows Southern fire ant, which is a close relative of red important fire ant. Uh, and you look at this guy, Kind of small, but then this is another worker which is much, much larger. I would say more than twice the size of the smaller one. And if you look, uh, you know, to look at other ones, you can see a similar trend. This is a small one, this is a major worker. Uh, so when we talk about size variation, um, it means that sometimes some ants have small and larger workers, and some other ones, you know, are all about the same. And this is very important in identification of some ants, such as fire ants. And uh, in Argentine ants, uh, you don't see that. This is another a very nice photo. It's very old that shows the size variation. So ants can be pretty small, like here, all the way to the largest one. And you have all these ants in between. And this is the queen. And these are all red imported uh, fire ants, okay? So there are many ants that you can find in the urban landscape, in the park. You know, I, I collected all these ants that you can see in this picture in a park, you know, and very close to each other, you know, not too far. So this is a pavement ant. Uh, this is a dark rover ant, a crazy ant. Uh, this is the Argentine ant, uh, which is one of the most common urban uh, ants in California. And then you have a permit ant, and this is a red imported fire ant, and this is a thief ant. 
So, so there are many ants, but most of these are not necessarily pro problematic. Uh, Argentine ants, yes, and red and imported fire ants, um, but they're not always, always problematic. This picture shows um, three different species which are um, about the same size, but they're complete, they have a different, completely different biology. So this is a southern fire ant, and in the middle you have red imported fire ant, and on the right you have the Argentine ant. So these two, they sting, and, um, but the Argentine ant, it doesn't sting. Um, so I'm gonna cover, I'm gonna talk about the, the two species on right uh, in the next slide. Another way that we can um, identify and classify ants is by their diet. Some ants love sweet, uh, sweets, uh, sweet food, like sugary water, honey, and anything like that. And some of them love uh, greasy food or oils, you know, vegetable oil, peanut butter, and things like that. Some ants nest in the ground. Actually, most ants nest in the ground, but some ants nest above the ground, inside wall, uh, wall voids like pharaoh ants, and some ants uh, build their nest inside wood like carpenter ant uh, that you can see in all these uh, three pictures. And we have another one, velvety tree ant. And all these, these two, and of course there are many carpenter ants, you know, just not one species. We have several carpenter ant species in California. All of them, you know, they live in wood. But the interesting thing is that unlike termites, they don't digest the wood. They just, you know, uh, bore into the wood, make galleries and make their nest uh, just to have a home, uh, but not, they do not eat the wood. They cannot digest the wood like termites do. But still they're a problem and they, they damage uh, structural wood. So if you have these in your home, uh, I would suggest uh, calling the professional because it's very difficult to, uh, a structural that is under a lot of, um, attack by these ants, you know, needs structural repair. And that usually requires license and a lot of expertise. So why we see ants around homes? Um, if you're looking outside, outdoors, usually they're just doing their, 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 their work. You know, they have a nest outside, they're feeding on other insects or they're tending sap feeding insects. Some of them feed on uh, seeds of various grasses. Um, but when they come inside, it could be for different reasons. Sometimes they're just foraging. And that's when you see one, two, three, and, and that's it. You don't see any trails. And that's when, uh, you know, they're exploring. They're just looking around for resources, but they, they're not causing problems yet. But when they find the food that they like, they're going to create a trail. You know, the foragers will go back to the colony and let everyone know that, hey, you know, I found sugar, honey, or something. Come and get it. You know, so they form these trails, and that's when you see an army of ants, you know, coming into the house, uh, or in, in the landscape too. You know, when they find aphids or any other type of food, uh, that's how they form trails. Sometimes, though, they come in because they're looking for a shelter. And this is a very difficult case to deal with because they're not interested in food. And no matter what type of, type of bait you use, they won't be interested in it. They are simply coming in to go and, and find a new spot for their, their nest, you know, because outside is too hot or maybe too cold or for any reason they decide to move, move in. And these cases are very difficult to control. And um, I have dealt with these cases in the past and I'll, I'll cover a little bit more at the end about this problem. So the first ant that I'm going to talk about is odorous house ants. So they can de develop extremely large colonies. So these, this ant lives inside and outside. Usually you can find colonies outside, but sometimes they just move in and, and they start a nest or they move their nest inside the house in the wall voids. Very difficult to access places in, in accessible areas. And um, they usually like sweet food. They, they like sweets. 
and uh, they, they feed on various stuff. And the reason for the name uh, odorous house and is that because when you when you crush them, you know, you this, they smell like like a rotten cheese, something like that. So that's the reason why they're called that. Barrow ant is a, is another ant that is very small, and they rarely they're they're rarely seen outside. They they always you see them always inside the house, so they're really specialized in building nests inside houses, and which makes their control very difficult because they nest in very inaccessible areas. So and that's why baiting is the more preferred method of control because when you spray, uh, spraying might divide the colony into smaller ones, and 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 you're not you won't be able to control the colony. You're just breaking the colony into pieces, and those pieces are going to grow and they're going to reproduce and uh, exacerbate the problem. And the colony size can can vary from a few hundred to many, many thousand, thousands of ants, depending on the age of the colony and you know, the availability of food and other resources. So next we have uh, red imported fire ant. Um, these ants, as I mentioned, they sting and uh, they can sometimes ca cause a lot of problems, especially for pets, for children. And here you can see, uh, the uh, uh, sting stinger and the poison gland that was extracted from the end. This is the stinger here. And uh, this is how our body reacts. You know, we develop uh, wells and postules and it can be painful. Um, it is actually very painful. I've been uh, stung several times in the past and uh, one or two for me wasn't that painful, but uh, when you get many ants on you, all, all this and all of a sudden you know, they start stinging you, that that's going to be very painful. And also, uh, you're going to deal with a lot of problems later. You know, you're going to get rash and other problems uh, and itching for a long time. So this ant is biting, as you can see, and at the same time it's stinging. So by biting, you know, they kind of secure themselves, and then they start stinging from the abdomen. Um, they make mounds like, like these, uh, like the one on right, in the middle of uh, uh, the lawn. And if, if the nest is close to uh, pavement or concrete, you'll see something like this. Sometimes there are other ants that create uh, similar, similar uh, kind of uh, mounds or uh, excavations. Um, the diet, of reef, uh, uh, they love greasy stuff, but it doesn't mean that they won't go after sugary stuff. And as you can see here, I provided them with sugary water and they loved it, you know? Um, but generally speaking, they prefer greasy stuff like peanut butter much, much better. So, and that's why most of the baits that I'm gonna talk about for fire ants, they have, uh, they're oily, they're oil based because that's what, what they love. The problem with uh, the fire ants is that um, you won't notice them. You know, we go out you know, to a park or to our lawn and sit down without knowing that there are fire ants around. And especially if there's a mound or a nest right beneath you, if you sit right on top of a mound, what's gonna happen is that, you know, very quickly a large number of ants will come out and they start climbing your legs and, and arms and they start stinging you. So Sometimes it can be very dangerous, but uh, generally speaking, we don't have the problem that people in the South have. We haven't had many extreme cases, but it happens. Here you can see uh, a lot of angry fire ants that I, that I was uh, working on uh, like two, two, three years ago. Um, so yeah, it's, it's best to avoid these um, because they will sting if they can reach you. Uh, this is the origin of uh, fire ants in South America, and here in the U.S. you can see the distribution. Uh, they're all over the South, and in, this is California, and I'm going to show more detailed pictures, uh, maps. Uh, this is the potential uh, future distribution of RIFA. The prediction is that, you know, uh, RIFA, or Red Imported Fire Ant, is going to reach even like Seattle. 
they're going to go all the way up, especially with global warming, because they don't like freezing. They don't survive cold, cold temperatures, especially freezing temperatures. But uh, with, with the global, global warming, you know, everything is going to change. And uh, the prediction is that they, they will be able to go north and reach you know, northern states, especially on the coast. This is the distribution map of uh, RIFA red imported fire ant in California. This is the border of Nevada. And if you look carefully, you can see this is the San Diego area and we have them there. Um, this map is, not, is from 2000. So I'm sure they have expanded at least a little bit. We have them in Los Angeles Basin, Coachella Valley big time, in Central Valley, and then all the way to Merced and uh, Stanislaus counties. And actually, uh, I went to Merced County uh, before COVID, and they're starting uh, to have a lot of problems, you know, in their schools and other parks. Uh, so RIFA has been there for a long time, but, but for some reason, now they're starting to create a lot of problems. This is a map of Orange County, Southern California. And as you can see, they're all over uh, Orange County, in many places. This is from uh, Orange County Vector Control. And this is a map of LA County uh, from 2001. As you can see, uh, RIFA has been reported in the north, kind of northern of parts of the county, uh, I mean, south of the mountains. Uh, and also on the eastern side of the county and a little bit in the south, uh, but nothing in the center and uh, nothing on the west side of the county. This is an updated map that I've created. You can check it out by going online to Map Hub. And this is the link. If you're interested, uh, shoot me an email and I'll send you uh, a link to the map. So the uh, blue ones, which say no means that, you know, I checked those places and I couldn't find uh, red important fire ants. But the, uh, uh, the ones with the ants, the markers show that, you know, I was able to find RIFA. All right, this is, these are some of the symptoms. And again, don't freak out when you see these. Uh, these rarely happen, very rarely. And uh, usually happens, you know, when people completely don't realize that uh, there's a big mound somewhere and they sit on it or something like that. So it's painful, it causes discomfort. And if you scratch a lot, if you, if you scratch yourself a lot, you might get secondary infections. And in very rare cases, people may develop uh, anaphylactic reaction. Um, these two species are very similar. So uh, southern fire ant is, an, is a kind of a native uh, ant species. They also stink, but they're not, they won't take over a large area like red imported fire ants do. Uh, usually you find them in isolated populations, nests, uh, and usually they're not a big problem, but uh, RIFA, that you can see on right, they, they can take over very large uh, turf area and, and you'll see them in huge numbers and of course they stink. Uh, people sometimes confuse uh, the harvester ants with red important fire ants and uh, the easiest way to tell them apart is the size. As I mentioned, harvester ants are pretty large and red important fire ants are much smaller and you usually see harvester ants in sandy soils, like bare sandy soils. So you don't find them in the middle of a lawn, like a very green and wet lawn in the middle of a town. Uh, you usually see them, you know, at the border of, of, the, of towns or uh, near natural areas mostly. Like when I go hiking, I see them a lot. Uh, or if your house is in, in, in the hills, you might see them, uh, but they don't occupy turf area like uh, RIFA does, Red Important Fire Ant does. All right, you already saw this one. And now we can talk about the Argentine ant. So Argentine ant is literally the most common urban ant species in California. 
all to find them all you have to do is go outside and just look around maybe move a stone or something just look at the edge of the turf and 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 the sidewalks and i can guarantee that you'll you'll see some uh, you'll see a trail or something and um, this species has one note on on its waist as you can see here and they prefer sweet food uh, foods all year round um, and the reason uh, for saying all year round is that some ants change their preference. So like for example, in the spring, they prefer more uh, protein and in the summer, they prefer, prefer more sweets. But this ant, you know, likes sweets uh, all the time, you know, all year round. Uh, they also tend and protect sap, uh, sap sucking insects such as aphids and scale insects, uh, soft scale insects and uh, they feed on honeydew. Uh, like, like some other ants, uh, the problem with Argentine ants is that when you try to control it, you're not dealing with one nest. You're not dealing with uh, a localized uh, infestation. You may be, mo most likely you're dealing with a large colony that is divided into a bunch of nests. And so the ants that you can see here, for example, around this home, maybe they're coming from here, but on this house, maybe they're coming from a local nest right here, or maybe they're coming from another nest between the two properties. So, uh, and that's why when we control Argentine ants, let's say they're getting into your home, like in the kitchen, and then you put some gel bait and control all and nothing else comes out. But all of a sudden, like, Two days later, you see huge number of them coming from the other side of the house. And that usually has to do with the fact that they're coming from different sources. There are different nests and they don't fight. Some ants, they, different nests, they really fight with each other and they don't tolerate each other. But uh, Argentine ants, they don't mind having uh, other ants around and actually they mingle very easily. And that makes their control a little, bit, a little bit more difficult. So mature colonies uh, have uh, multiple queens. Usually they have 16 queens per 1,000 workers. And uh, imagine in a large colony, you know, let's say if the colony is 100,000 individuals, you can easily have uh, 1,600 queens. So that's another problem because to eradicate the colony, we need to kill all the queens. But if there are too many, then it's just not possible, right? It, it makes it very difficult. Worker ants uh, forage about 180 feet or 60 meters or more uh, in search of food, which is uh, equivalent to like half, half of the football field rectangle, okay? the whole rectangle, not just the playing field. Um, Unlike fire ants, uh, they have similar size, as I mentioned. Uh, on left, you can see Argentine ants. They all have similar size versus fire ants uh, on right. Um, at least in Southern California, uh, the peak of activity of Argentine ant is about uh, September, late September, depending on the year, depending on the temperature. And uh, if you see a lot of problems, uh, in September or maybe early October, um, that needs to be addressed. But but just keep in mind that the problem will go away by itself if you even if you do don't do anything. Uh, so sometimes we try to fight them, but the the pest pressure is so high they're coming inside or into your garden from all different angles and there's nothing that you can do. Uh, but just keep, in, keep, keep that in mind that this problem is probably temporary because the activity uh, really goes down quickly in October, you know, because the temperature, you know, uh, it cools down and everything. Um, all right, so people ask me, uh, when I, if, if we have Argentine ants and fire ants around, and do these guys fight and who's gonna win? Um, the answer is that yes, they, they do fight with each other, but unfortunately the uh, winner is uh, red imported fire ants. And that is because 
they um, they use a, a behavior called ve venom dabbing. So they use venom and they just throw uh, the venom, you know, and stick it to uh, their enemies. And the venom, you know, is a very strong weapon that kills the enemies. So Argentinians do not do well uh, when fighting with uh, red imported fire ants. I wish they could, but um, they can't. So this is another example of uh, like an excavation kind of mound that you can see on uh, intersection of, of a sidewalk and, and a lawn. And this is another example. So the, the, the shape of the mound can look very different for, um, I'm sorry, these are red and portable fire ant pictures. So uh, I guess you know, they're a little bit displaced. Um, this is another, uh, in, in drier areas of California, for example, Riverside, sometimes you see damage to the uh, bare ground, for example, in the infields of uh, baseball, softball fields. And usually the grounds crew don't like it because you know it messes up the appearance and they have to fix it all the time. And usually, you know, when I went to the sites, different sites, I, I, uh, I collected some of the ants and I realized that there are the pyramid ants. Uh, so these are not Argentine ants or nor uh, the fire ants. This is a different species that uh, does that. So now that we uh, kind of went over the diversity of ants, let's go over the management and see what options we have. So because we follow, uh, I'm trying to promote IPM, I'm going to talk about the principles of IPM here. And generally speaking, you know, we first try to, this is an uh, IPM pyramid. And as you can see, it's, it starts with identification and understanding pest biology. And then you go up, uh, you know, uh, sanitation, cultural control, uh, and then you try to exclude them or you know, use traps and things like that and biological control if there's an option. And then lastly, you do chemical treatment. So these pyramids and similar charts are designed for agriculture, which is great, but um, these charts, they do not address the issue of emergency. So if you have a lot of ants inside your house or on your plants and you have aphids there, uh, most likely you don't wanna wait that long. You know, you, you, you simply don't have the time to wait for, uh, uh, exclusion or cultural control or things like that to work. You need to knock down uh, the population, do something very quick, and then start doing things. And that's why I'm, um, uh, I'm a fan of a modified uh, or inverted uh, IPM pyramid. So in that plan, you start, you knock down the population, you Use, a pest, use pesticides or whatever fast acting material that you have. And then you start to think about, okay, uh, what should we do next? And how should I prevent this problem from coming back in the future? Yes, and this is very uh, more practical in heavy infestations, okay? And I'm gonna talk about the other options. So in this plan, you suppress first and then you start excluding, um, uh, even like with biological control, there, there aren't many options for ants, unfortunately, but whatever you want to do, uh, if there's an emergency situation, you need to suppress first and then work on the other ones. And hopefully next time you're going to have much smaller infest infestation in your yard, in your house. Uh, if you're dealing with ants inside your house, uh, you can use ant exclusion. You can use, uh, you, you can you do caulking, you know, and, and use different material uh, to kind of block and seal cracks and crevices or uh, holes. And this can make a big difference uh, because as long as you have these openings, uh, new ants will find it and get into the structure. But when you block them, you can do a lot of uh, prevention uh, uh, in the future. This is another example, you know, uh, of using uh, 
using like ceiling and exclusion of ants inside homes. Um, so uh, as I mentioned, uh, many, many, many times we have to use insecticides. Uh, we, it's, it's a little bit difficult to uh, avoid them, but they can really help us to suppress the pest population. Uh, and then, you know, give us time. They're gonna give us time to think about and plan and, and implement a, a very good IPM uh, protocol. So uh, generally speaking, pesticides, especially the synthetic ones, they're more reliable. Uh, also applies to like mineral uh, uh, insecticides, like uh, if you use boric acid, for example, they have uh, a long shelf life. And if you use them correctly, they can be pretty reliable. Uh, the problem that some of some pesticides have is uh, pesticide resistance. If you use too much, you're gonna have to deal with pesticide resistance where nothing works. And then you need to be careful about health hazards and environmental hazards um, that I mentioned. Okay, so when you use chemicals, you have different options. You can spray or hire a pest control company to do the spraying for you, or you can use dust or bait. So spraying and dust, uh, these, two, these two are faster. They work faster than bait. But baits, especially for ants, provide a much better long-term control. Because with spraying, you're killing just a fraction of an ant colony versus with the bait, you're most likely, if you do it right, you know, you're going to kill uh, the larvae and hopefully the queen or some of the queen. So you're going to get much better results with baiting, especially for ants. So liquid insecticides, they work pretty fast, um, but they may break a colony into a smaller one. But when you use baits, uh, you need to be more patient, but again, the result is going to be better. Uh, sometimes, you know, we, 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 we want to kill pests, the pest, but in reality, we're just killing a portion of the colony. So I personally think that, um, well, sometimes you know it's just better to repel pests, and you can use dust, you can use insecticides to repel them because as long as they're not causing problems for us, we don't care how many ants are outside, right? But when they get in or they start, you know, uh, protecting uh, uh, landscape pests, that's when you know we need to intervene. Uh, and this is a, just an idea about uh, eradication versus management. Many times we think we are eradicating a colony, but in reality, we're just managing the colony because we don't know if, if we kill the whole colony of ants or maybe like 10% of them are still alive uh, in the ground. Uh, a quick note about bait concentration. The higher the concentration, the faster the result, but the lower the control is going to be. And the reason is that when you use a fast acting product or higher concentrations, there's simply not enough time for the ants to, uh, for the bait, I'm talking about baits, to pass the bait to the larvae, to, uh, to the queens. But when you low, use lower concentrations, you have plenty of time to do that. So um, this is a, like a, recommendation uh, based on the species. So if you're dealing with Argentine ants, uh, you can do spraying or baiting. For fire ants, baiting is the only recommended way uh, that is supported by science because spraying is just a waste of time. And also with odorous house ants and pharaoh ants. So uh, baiting works much better with these guys. Um, when you uh, deal with a pest, make sure that the product that, that you're going to use is registered uh, uh, for, for, for controlling that species. For example, this is a pesticide label. And if you look, um, these pests are mentioned here, acrobat ants, Argentine ants, big-headed ants, blah, blah, the rest of them. So make sure that the pest is mentioned because if not, you may not be able to get with results from using the bait. These are some examples of baits um, that are used for fire ants. Um, 
very different, different active ingredients, uh, different volumes. Uh, some of them act very fast, uh, like in two to seven days. Uh, some of them are a little bit slower and some of them need months. Uh, you need to wait months uh, for the bait to start to work, but they provide pretty good control if you have, can wait that long. Uh, and then the price range can be very different and it applies to all products in the market, not just for fire ants. And um, yeah, please read the labels uh, carefully because the label has a lot of very important information that you need to follow, uh, you know, uh, in order not to uh, break the law. All right, so now that I've covered uh, all the basics, I'm going to summarize what I said. So anytime you deal with an ant uh, pest, first try to identify the ant species because if you don't do a good job identifying the ants, you're, going to, you're not going to be able to control it effectively. Then find products that are labeled for the target pest. And then think about how fast you want to control the ants. Do you want immediate results like in hours or maybe one day? or no, you can wait a little bit longer because that really changes your options. So liquid insecticides, uh, as you can see here, you know, are good for very quick uh, knockdown um, and they're fast acting. But then if you, the situation is not emergency, then baits are great options. And sometimes baits are, on, are the only option that you have. And I already mentioned uh, some of these, but for carpenter ants or velvety tree ants that you can see on right, uh, leave it to professionals. Uh, that's my suggestion. But if you want to use something yourself, you need to use a greasy bait, a grease base or oily bait, because that's what they like better. Uh, for fire ants, as I said, um, use granular baits that are specifically registered for fire ants because most baits are gel based and are sweet uh, and, and fire ants are not really interested in that. So for Argentine ants, you're going to have many options. For harvest ants, you know, usually you don't need to do anything. They're, they can sting, but most of the time, you know, they are in bare sandy soil. So I, we can just leave them alone unless there's a very a specific situation that requires control. So, um, so you know, consider using you know uh, a ceiling structure, you know, uh, cracks and crevices, and 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 uh, seal the holes, uh, and also sanitation. Make sure you're not uh, leaving a lot of food outside fridge. And if you have pets, be careful about uh, cat food and dog food because they love those items. And uh, I used to have a cat and, and ants were crazy, you know, uh, they were going after the food all the time. Um, when you want to place uh, the bait, make sure that you place it if you can and if the label allows you. Put it on right on the tray of the end because if you put it somewhere else, in many cases, they're not going to go, they're not going to find it, they're not going to be that interested. Uh, but, but make sure that you follow the label because sometimes you have to put it only in cracks and crevices or in the bait station. Uh, also use fresh bait uh, all the time because if you bought, bought a, bait, uh, a bait like five years ago and you kept it in the garage and it got cold and really hot, that bait is not going to be very effective anymore. It's not going to be attractive to ants. Uh, and also bait stations, there are various bait stations that you can buy to put in landscape or put indoors uh, to kind of protect kids, you know, pets. Um, the downside is that sometimes these bait stations are not that attractive uh, because, you know, when ants come in, you know, they follow a trail and if anything is on the trail, they're going to pay attention. But if it's something outside the trail, they're not going to pay attention. So just keep that in mind. Uh, and sometimes, guys, you know, no matter what you do, I mean, nothing works sometimes. And one of the scenarios that I've dealt with is when ants come in for shelter. And 
when they come in for shelter, they're not interested in food, no matter what type of bait you put on their trail or in a bait station, they're not gonna pay attention. They're not gonna be interested. So the only way to control them is to use a strong repellent insecticide. And usually pest control companies are equipped with, with those material and they're very good at that. So that's one of the situations where really nothing works, but again, Everything is seasonal and usually that the problem will go away, but it may cause a lot of uh, anxiety and, and discomfort and uh, because you know, there's simply such a big nuisance you know, when you have thousands of ants in your kitchen or your living room. Uh, so the exclusion is very important, but keep in mind that you know, we can't always find all the entry points. So do your best to seal as much as you can and find all the holes and cracks and entry points, but it's sometimes it's just impossible to, you know, block all the ants out. They'll find a new way. They they make new holes or uh, expand the the, uh, the current uh, uh, cracks and crevices and find a new way for coming in. And for pesticide, as I mentioned, sometimes it's just more practical to repel and kill because. Is something we don't know what's happening in the soil and the colony can be very large, you know, hundreds of thousands of ants. So these are the things that I wanted to mention to you guys. Hope you enjoyed the presentation. And if you have um, any specific question about pest control, uh, you can contact me. Uh, I know that many of you are master gardeners, so you might, many of you, uh, you know, help others with these problems, but if something gets really complicated, then you can contact me and here's my website that you can check out. So thank you very much for inviting me, um, Carrie, Elaine and Belinda.